right, dear Heavenly Dad, thank you so much for this opportunity to be here together. It seems like everything in life is a little bit different now. Every little thing that we do left, right, all, all seems just a little bit changed. But we know that you are steady. We know that you are unchanged. Just like all the songs that we sang today, your love is constant and perfect, and you're someone steady that we can count on. Thank you for being here through all of this for us. Thank you so much for Pastor Joe. Thank you for the worship team. Thank you for the opportunity to continue to praise you through music. And thank you for the opportunity to hear your word as placed on Joe's heart. Please help us, no matter what's going on at home right now, to just set it all aside and be able to focus our thoughts and our heart on this message. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jen. <coughs> um, while this is not as good as being in person, um, it's good that we have this ability to stream live and worship with you. Thank you, band, for great job as always. Um, just a couple of things. I need to address a scandal in our church. Many of you have been messaging me for two weeks, and I've been trying to avoid this scandal, but people have been asking me about Tom Brady coming to the Buccaneers. And I don't know what the problem is. I think everybody that knows me knows he's my all-time favorite player. I've always loved Tom Brady. He's my favorite of all time, and I'm just thrilled that I finally get to cheer for him on my team instead of the Patriots, who are my second favorite team of all time. Isn't that right, Dylan? Um, see, there's four people here, and they're all laughing. Trust me, it's very funny. Um, another thing, I want to I give a shout-out to some special guests watching live from uh, Inserlik Army Base in Turkey. It's my cousin Ty Kofal in the 39th Medical Group. <laughs> Thank you guys for your service to our country. Um, we're humbled to have you watching, and we hope to be a blessing to you uh, today. All right, so in a way of introduction, we're continuing with our series on the Gospel of Mark. This is uh, week 22, and I've titled it Hard to Believe. <clears throat> um, so current events have revealed to many of us a world we knew existed, but we didn't really pay much attention to it until recently. And here's the world I'm talking about. I'm talking about the world of microbiology. <laughs> Over the last month, many of us have learned more than we ever want to know about microbiology and epidemiology. And if you weren't a germaphobe before, you certainly are now. And most of us have become experts, frankly, in epidemiology. And I know this because I see all your posts on Facebook, and I want you to know I've made strong, concrete medical decisions based upon your advice on social media. We've all also become very good experts at recognizing the symptoms of COVID-19. We know it's fever and body aches and a dry cough. That one freaked me out the most because I had some allergies this week. <clears throat> but um, before this, most of us were pretty much oblivious to microbiology. But what if we're just as oblivious to the symptoms of another pandemic, pandemic, and that is the pandemic of unbelief? Let me read to you from Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. And Jesus went away from there, and he came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished. And I'll get into that word astonished, what it really means later. <clears throat> they were saying, where did this man get these things? What is this wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters right here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could not do mighty works there or miracles except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went out among the other villages teaching. So what we do at Grace Life, you look at each passage three ways. You look at the history of the passage. What about man? What did he do and why and how did he do it? Then we look at the spiritual side. What about God or Jesus? What does he do and why and how does he do it? And then we can look at the devotional or the personal side. What about me? What are we supposed to do and how do we do it? I want to talk about... The history of this is the G, uh, Jesus of Nazareth. I want, you to explain, I want you to learn where Nazareth was and what it was. It was in the middle of absolutely nowhere. So first century Nazareth was probably about 60 acres of dry, dusty, rocky hillside town. About 500 people at the most. And it is way out in the boondocks. 
And it's never even mentioned in the Old Testament. It's not even mentioned in any religious scrolls by the Jewish community, like the Talmud or the Mishnah. First century life confined to Nazareth would be hopeless. <clears throat> Anyone there, able, would look for a way out. And when Jesus called one of his apostles, Nathaniel, you know what Nathaniel's response was? In uh, uh, John 1, 46, it's, can anything good come out of Northport? I mean, <laughs> I'm sorry, Nazareth? I don't know. How did I get up there? Kevin, did you do that? This is Jesus' second trip back to Nazareth. The last time in the synagogue, he had claimed to be God, and the crowd wanted him dead. Even his family thought he was an absolute insane lunatic. They were afraid for their safety and for his, and they demanded that he stop this nonsense and come home with them. So now he's back again, and they basically don't see him as Jesus of Nazareth. They don't see him as Messiah. They see him as Joseph's boy. <clears throat> this return trip doesn't go any better. Back in that synagogue, he stirs up the trouble, and it seems they are offended at his popularity, I suppose. No doubt there was jealousy. I mean, this was little Jesus. With all this, it's the town that knew Jesus better than anyone. I mean, he grew up here. Everyone knew his family. For 30 years, this was his home. As a kid, he played in the streets. As a young man, he learned the family business. <clears throat> they knew who the brothers and sisters of Jesus were. They knew Mary, Joseph, who's probably dead by now. Jesus was absolutely no stranger to this town of Nazareth. They all knew him well. And even with all the miracles he's done, the dynamic teaching, they still could not see him or refuse to see him as Messiah, as God. They can only see him as little Jesus. They knew him when he grew up for 30 years, a boy who became a carpenter, and now, a couple years ago, he left. And now he's back again. He's the most well-known rabbi in all the region, in the whole country. They've heard the rumors about the movement, the miracles, the messages, and their response is fascinating. Mark tells us they were astonished. But actually, the Greek tells us it's a much stronger response than our English Bibles give it credit for. Here is the Greek word. It's ek pleso. Here's what it means. The word astonished translated our English Bible. Here's what it actually means. To strike out or to expel by force out of panic or self-preservation. This is their response to Jesus. Not, wow, who is this guy? It's like, who is this guy? Who does he think he is? Get out of here. So this is what the Greek word astonished actually means from their perspective. When they're astonished at him, they're not marveling. They're not admiring. They're saying, get out. We don't want you here. We're going to preserve our way of life. Leave. I mean, you'd think the people in this stupid little podunk village would embrace one of their own, right? He's made it big. He's famous. But instead, they hated him. He is the only claim to fame this pitiful little town has ever had or, frankly, ever will have. The only reason you know about Nazareth is because of Jesus. How could little Jesus, a carpenter, have such incredible insight into the law? Who do you think he is? Get out of here. So that's the history. Let's look at the spiritual. What about Jesus? I want to talk about the scourge of unbelief. <clears throat> the spiritual infection that this town is suffering is so pervasive, it amazed Jesus. It's sort of like, if you'll allow me, how we look at these numbers of COVID-19 every day as, a, as the infections go up and the deaths and people in critical condition. And it's pretty staggering to see the exponential growth. I had a friend of mine who's a doctor explain to me the impact of the exponential growth, and it's pretty mind-boggling to watch. 
And to wrap your head around Jesus' response, we need to look at the specific word used to describe his amazement, because the scripture says he was astonished. But here's the Greek word. It is thamazo. It means to wonder, to marvel, or to be perplexed or confused. Like, really? That's your response to me? It is used 30 times in the New Testament. Most of the time, it's describing how other people reacted to the stuff he did or said. People were amazed by him. You did what? But here, Jesus is stunned. Jesus, God, is stunned by how he is treated in his own hometown. Humanly speaking, remember, he's not a robot. He's human, and he feels all the emotion and pain and things that we feel. I would imagine it hurt. <clears throat> I mean, yes, Jesus was God, but he wasn't without human emotion. Certainly rejection by friends and family in a hometown was painful for him. So understanding how both words are used together is key to understand the emotion that is boiling over in this passage, and it's very high. They are astonished, and the word means they are striking out in self-preservation and panic. Get away. He is astonished by amazement, marvel, like, really? Think about how you would feel if you came home after, say, serving with valor in the military abroad, risking your life, and upon returning home, people that you knew best scoff at you. We knew you as a runny-nosed ankle biter. You weren't special. I remember when I first got my first job in ministry, I was a youth pastor in a Chinese church in Tampa, and some people in my home church scoffed at me. Wait, what? They hired little Joey to be their youth pastor? It hurt that they didn't believe in the calling God had given. This is nothing compared to what Jesus is probably feeling. Because what we see here is Nazareth is very bad soil. I mean, add to this the fact that not only is he amazed by their unbelief and probably hurt by it, he also understands the end result of their unbelief, which is eternal separation from Heavenly Dad. Do you remember back in chapter 4, we talked about the parable of the seeds and the sower, and Jesus breaks down the different types of soil. It is very clear which one they are, and it's in Mark 4, 15. And here's the type of soil Nazareth is. And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown, and when they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Jesus is amazed at how committed they are to their bitterness, their jealousy, and their reaction to the success and calling of one of their own. I mean, at least in Galilee, where Jesus had spent a lot of time, at least there, people are curious. <clears throat> the miracles, the sermons. I mean, he was intriguing. With Nazareth, they've all seen and heard all the stories reported about what Jesus has done in Galilee, and this is their response. They've done it twice now. Not once, twice. Despite all that has been said and done by Jesus, not only is there unbelieving, unbelief in what he's doing, they aren't even curious. Yes, it's very clear Nazareth is completely 100% bad soil. And it's hard to imagine Jesus making an any stronger case for who he is, his power and his authority than he already has. It's complete, ultimate rejection of Jesus by Nazareth, a foreshadow of how the nation of Israel would reject him later. But you understand there's something else Jesus does here. I want you to understand the gospel isn't miracles. I mean, we like miracles. We like reading about them. We like them when they happen to us. And Mark says that Jesus could not do any miracles there. It's not because their unbelief rendered him powerless. There are some out there that would teach that. If you don't have faith, Jesus can't help you or God can't. That is not true. God is not limited by our unfaithfulness. If, it's, if that were the case, he could never do anything because we're all born unfaithful. The reason for the miracles that Jesus would perform was for this reason. He wanted to reveal himself to those he was calling to his sheep. He didn't do miracles to show off, but to call people who he was going to save. 
The miracles were designed to declare his identity as the Son of God for all those who would receive. But Nazareth has rejected him. And he made it clear the genesis of faith cannot be miraculous signs and wonders. When the religious asked for a sign in heaven in Matthew 16, verses 1 through 4, I'll just read it. And the Pharisee and the Sadducee came to test Jesus, and they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. These are the religious asking him to show them a sign. And he answered them, When it is evening, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be stormy, for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given. To accept the sign, to it, accept the sign of Jonah. And so he left them and departed. See, there was no sovereign plan anymore in place to open the hearts and minds of the people of Nazareth. God was done with his work there. There was nothing Jesus was going to say or do that would convince them to believe. They were hardened hearts, a bad place for seeds, and Jesus is permanently done. So let's look at the personal side of this. What about us? What are we supposed to do with this story? I want to talk about this pandemic of unbelief. Here was the, uh, you know, I think I got a little famous this week because Mark the Evangelist retweeted my Sunday sermon preview. I don't know if you saw that. He's talking about how he said they had mad symptoms of unbelief in Nazareth. And here was my, my tweet. As we become more familiar with the symptoms of COVID-19, are you showing any symptoms of unbelief? So you might think a sermon about unbelief isn't for you if you're a Christian. But my goal today is to help all of you see unbelief with fresh eyes. I want you to look at this differently. The fresh eyes that I want you to have about unbelief today is that most of us can't even see it when it's coming. You might say, well, that's Nazareth's fault. They couldn't see who Jesus was after all he did. Well, they deserve what they get. But what we see as Nazareth's unbelief is actually what they saw, get this now, as zealous religious belief in religion that they thought was superior to Jesus. What happened in Nazareth was that unbelief, like a virus, snuck up on them and they couldn't see it coming. And think about Israel. They saw massive miracles in the wilderness. God destroying the army of Egypt, feeding them with manna from heaven and all that stuff that was going on. And you know what they wanted to do in the end? They wanted to make a golden cow. <laughs> Unbelief snuck up on Israel. And they didn't even realize it. Adam and Eve walked and talked with God every day. And they still ate the fruit. Was that unbelief? Absolutely it was. So with all that, do you think we as church people are any better than these people? You don't think unbelief can sneak up on the church? If you don't think, if, think about this. If Nazareth and Israel got infested with unbelief, you don't think we can as well? Maybe already are? Because I'm going to tell you, it's a massive infection. I mean, this speaks to the natural spiritual frailty of the human heart, in my opinion, when it comes to faith in the supernatural. And I don't mean, this is not a cheap attempt to try to be relevant, but this mind, this thought has been going in my mind all week. I think it's why COVID-19 is such a great illustration of how pervasive the infection of human, human unbelief can be. It's a stark reminder to us our physical human frailty, shattering the delusion of human invincibility. And now, in the face of this pandemic, we're facing this earthly pandemic. We're all constantly doing Google searches to see if our latest discomfort is some sort of early sign of COVID-19. Don't lie, admit it, you've done it, I have, all of us. Hey Google, 
<laughs> Look, COVID-19 is certainly a dangerous pandemic. But I believe the deadliest pandemic that we don't see coming is unbelief. Just like we can't see COVID-19 coming because it's a virus and it's microorganisms. Unbelief is even more contagious, infecting even more people. While COVID-19 causes earthly suffering, unbelief causes both earthly and eternal suffering. Unbelief is far more contagious, infecting every human heart and every human mind since the beginning of time from birth. In fact, COVID-19 has helped me. It's revealed many symptoms of unbelief in my life. Okay, well, I know it has for me, maybe not for any of you, but for me, it certainly has opened my eyes to what I was not seeing, how unbelief had snuck up on me in so many areas. So with that in mind, I want to give you some symptoms of unbelief that you might be suffering from. You may not even realize it. It's important to learn to spot symptoms early. Wouldn't it be great if we become just as diligent with monitoring our symptoms of unbelief as we are right now with the symptoms of COVID-19? I mean, if you go to the grocery store and you cough, like 18 people look at you with a scowl. Now, the symptoms of unbelief in non-Christians, oh, you know, well, those are easy to spot. But they don't believe in Jesus. And we're really good, by the way, at pointing out the symptoms of unbelief in non-Christians. We are really good and really quick and really fast at that. The problem with this is just like with a virus, unbelief mutates from identifiable symptoms in non-Christians to what's even more dangerous, stealth, subtle symptoms in Christians. At first, we don't recognize its infection, its impacts, or the power of its contagion. And there are symptoms that are very difficult to identify without training. Symptoms like cynicism, spiritual apathy and religious comfort, how about this one? Life without any real sacrifice. Oh, you might give some things, but it doesn't really impact your life at all. It's not really sacrifice. That might be a symptom of unbelief. And soon these subtle symptoms mutate into several things. You ready? Trust in money over Jesus. Priority of possessions being more important than people. And then suddenly you've got an even more serious symptom, a lack of prayer. It's kind of a waste of time. No joy. Do you remember our definition of joy? Joy is the supernatural satisfaction with the presence of God over anything the world has to offer. Suddenly, one of the more obvious symptoms might be a lack of joy. And then here's one. You ready? You want another symptom of unbelief? You start to accept your own private, secret, personal sins that nobody knows about. Oh, no big deal. That's a symptom of unbelief. Worry. Anxiety. What, you don't trust God's sovereign plan anymore? Judgmental attitudes. Anger. Bitterness. And here, now you really know if you have unbelief when you start isolating from God's people. Choosing to sleep in on Sunday. I can tell you right now, after all of this, I don't know how any child of God would ever want to skip church again. I miss it so much. I miss being with God's people more than you know. Brought me to points of tears. I even put a little tweet out about it this week about how awesome that first Sunday back with everybody is just going to be so amazing. It's going to be, am I, allowed, am I cool enough to use this word? It's going to be lit. Am I allowed to say that? No. <coughs> I really miss it. But when you start taking for granted meeting with God's people, it's a symptom that you might have the virus of unbelief. There's only one cure. There's no man-made vaccine for unbelief. No religious therapy or spiritual practice. You know why? Because humanly speaking, we are unable, just like we cannot see a virus with the naked eye, we can't see unbelief with the human eye. 
As we are dependent on others to survive the carnage of COVID-19, doctors, scientists, we are even more reliant upon the sovereign power and grace of our heavenly dad to rescue us from the infection of unbelief. The natural condition of the human heart is in fact unbelief. And the only cure is sovereign intervention. As a matter of fact, my favorite passage in the Bible, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this, this is a pronoun, it's antecedent, is faith. For, I, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. That's why you guys have always heard me say faith is a gift. It's not a result of works so that no one can brag. According to this, thinking your belief is born of your own cognitive, spiritual brilliance and ability. To see Jesus for who he is. Like you're better than Nazareth. Well, that's just a lack of belief in God's sovereignty and salvation. And you're replacing it with your sovereignty in salvation. That too is reliance upon human responsibility if you think about it. It would be like saying, if you will allow me, like this is a great example. I have decided that COVID-19 will not be infecting me because I am smart enough to see how it is bad for me. And so what do we do? What's the cure? <clears throat> There's a great story about this. What should be the condition of the human heart? and mind if we want to be cured from this infection of unbelief. There's a story that I love that we will explore later on in our study in the Gospel of Mark in a couple of months. Maybe. <laughs> Might be three. I don't know. It's about a rabbi who desperately comes to Jesus for help. Watch this. You ready? This is amazing. The guy's asking for help and Jesus says, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately, the father of the child, this religious leader, cried out and said, I love this. I believe. And then he follows up, help me with my unbelief. Isn't that powerful? I believe, but help me with my unbelief. <clears throat> it's amazing. See, I think this is a great example of how we need to constantly pursue Jesus. I believe. But please, Dad, please, Jesus, help me with my unbelief. I know it's there. I can't even see where it's affecting me. Can you please show me? Show me the symptoms. It's supernaturally inspired motivation that creates a helpless reliance upon Dad to reveal our unbelief. How? So one of the favorite parts of the book that I just wrote on Psalm 119 is this section on where the ability to see spiritual things actually comes from. And it's from Psalm 119, verse 118. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. See, church, if you want to escape this infection, this pandemic of unbelief that is rampant within and outside of the church, we must be constantly going to Heavenly Dad, humbly, desperately pleading with him to teach us what the symptoms are. It is the only vaccine and the only therapy that staves off the stealth infection of unbelief outside of the church and within it. Dad, <clears throat> When you look at the light of unbelief in this perspective, it's very scary. <clears throat> we like to, in our arrogance, think we've got it under control. Oh, no, we believe in Jesus. We believe in God. But even other people who have believed in you still had symptoms of unbelief creep in. Lord, we are aware of it today because of your word, because of your truth. We don't want to be like Nazareth. But left to our own, we definitely will be. So we're begging you, open our eyes. Please, Jesus, we believe, but please help us with our unbelief. 
protect us from those symptoms, we recognize that without that sovereign intervention, without you giving us the gift of faith, unbelief will ravage our heart and our mind and our soul and leave us dying and separated. And so in that light, we all pray today, we believe, but please help us with our unbelief. Amen. <clears throat> Church, we cannot tell you how much we miss you. I know I do. If you need anything during this time, somebody to run errands for you, somebody to get you something, you need some help with stuff, church family, we got your back, we're here. You just got to let us know. Give us the honor and the privilege of serving alongside of you during this time. We got young, energetic, strong people who are ready to do whatever you need. We got people who aren't so strong and energetic that are ready to support financially those young people that are willing to give you whatever you need. Just make sure you let us know. We love you and we're thankful for you. Have a great week. Stay in contact with one another.